Chapter Eleven, Part One of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: Elijah before his translation. The biblical account of the prophet Elijah, of his life and work during the reigns of Ahab and his son Joram, gives but a faint idea of a personage whose history begins with Israel's sojourn in Egypt and will end only when Israel, under the leadership of the Messiah, shall have taken up his abode again in Palestine. The scripture tells us only the name of Elijah's home, but it must be added that he was a priest, identical with Phineas, the priest zealous for the honor of God, who distinguished himself on the journey through the desert and played a prominent role again in the time of the judges. Elijah's first appearance in the period of the kings was his meeting with Ahab in the house of Hiel, the Bethelite, the commander-in-chief of the Israelitish army, whom he was visiting to condole with him for the loss of his sons. God himself had charged the prophet to offer sympathy to Hiel, whose position demanded that honor be paid him. Elijah at first refused to seek out the sinner who had violated the divine injunction against rebuilding Jericho, for he said that the blasphemous talk of such evil doers always called forth his rage. Thereupon God promised Elijah that fulfillment should attend whatever imprecation might in his wrath escape him against the godless for their unholy speech. As the prophet entered the general's house, he heard Hiel utter these words, Blessed be the Lord God of the pious, who grants fulfillment to the words of the pious. Hiel thus acknowledged that he had been justly afflicted with Joshua's curse against him who should rebuild Jericho. Ahab mockingly asked him, Was not Moses greater than Joshua, and did he not say that God would let no rain descend upon the earth if Israel served and worshipped idols? There is not an idol known to which I do not pay homage, yet we enjoy all that is goodly and desirable. Dost thou believe that if the words of Moses remain unfulfilled, the words of Joshua will come true? Elijah rejoined, Be it as thou sayest, as the Lord, the God of Israel, liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. In pursuance of his promise, God could not but execute the words of Elijah, and neither dew nor rain watered the land. A famine ensued, and Ahab sought to wreak his vengeance upon the prophet. To escape the king's persecutions, Elijah hid himself. He was sustained with food brought from the larder of the pious king Jehoshaphat by ravens, which at the same time would not approach near to the house of the iniquitous Ahab. God, who has compassion even upon the impious, tried to induce the prophet to release him from his promise. To influence him, he made the brook run dry, whence Elijah drew water for his thirst. As this failed to soften the inflexible prophet, God resorted to the expedient of causing him pain through the death of the son of the widow with whom Elijah was abiding, and by whom he had been received with great honor. When her son, who was later to be known as the prophet Jonah, died, she thought God had formerly been gracious to her on account of her great worthiness as compared with the merits of her neighbors and of the inhabitants of the city, and now he had abandoned her because her virtues had become as naught in the presence of the great prophet. In his distress, Elijah supplicated God to revive the child. Now God had the prophet in his power. He could give heed unto Elijah's prayer only, provided the prophet released him from the promise about a drought, for resuscitation from death is brought about by means of dew, and this remedy was precluded so long as Elijah kept God to his word, withholding dew and rain from the earth. Elijah saw there was nothing for it but to yield. However, he first betook himself to Ahab, with the purpose of overcoming the obduracy of the people upon whom the famine had made no impression. 
manifest wonders displayed before their eyes were to teach them wisdom. The combat between Good and Baal took place on Carmel, the mount that had esteemed itself the proper place for the greatest event in Israelitish history, the revelation of the law was compensated by the many miracles now performed upon it for its disappointment at Sinai's having been preferred to it. The first wonder occurred in connection with the choice of the bullocks. According to Elijah's arrangement with Ahab, one was to be sacrificed to God and then one to Baal. A pair of twins raised together were brought before the contestants, and it was decided by Lot which belonged to God and which to Baal. Elijah had no difficulty with his offering. Quickly he led it to his altar. But all the priests of Baal, 850 in number, could not make their victim stir a foot. When Elijah began to speak persuasively to the bullock of Baal, urging it to follow the idolatrous priests, it opened its mouth and said, We two, yonder bullock and myself, came forth from the same womb. We took our food from the same manger, and now he has been destined for God as an instrument for the glorification of the divine name, while I am to be used for Baal as an instrument to enrage my Creator. Elijah urged, Do thou but follow the priests of Baal, that they may have no excuse, and then thou wilt have a share in that glorification of God, for which my bullock will be used. The bullock. So dost thou advise, but I swear I will not move from the spot, unless thou with thine own hands wilt deliver me up. Elijah thereupon led the bullock to the priests of Baal. In spite of this miracle, the priests sought to deceive the people. They undermined the altar, and Hiel hid himself under it with the purpose of igniting a fire at the mention of the word Baal. But God sent a serpent to kill him. In vain the false priest cried and called Baal, Baal. The expected flame did not shoot up. To add to the confusion of the idolaters, God had imposed silence upon the whole world. The powers of the upper and of the nether regions were dumb. The universe seemed deserted and desolate, as if without a living creature. If a single sound had made itself heard, the priest would have said, It is the voice of Baal. That all preparations might be completed in one day, the erection of the altar, the digging of the trench, and whatever else was necessary, Elijah commanded the sun to stand still. For Joshua, he said, thou didst stand still, that Israel might conquer his enemies. Now stand thou still, neither for my sake, nor for the sake of Israel, but that the name of God may be exalted. And the sun obeyed his words. Toward evening, Elijah summoned his disciple Elisha and bade him pour water over his hands. A miracle happened. Water flowed out from Elijah's fingers until the whole trench was filled. Then the prophet prayed to God to let fire descend, but in such wise that the people would know it to be a wonder from heaven and not think it a magician's trick. He spoke, Lord of the world, thou wilt send me as a messenger at the end of time. But if my words do not meet with fulfillment now, the Jews cannot be expected to believe me in the latter days. His pleading was heard on high, and fire fell from heaven upon the altar, a fire that not only consumed what it touched, but also licked up the water. Nor was that all. His prayer for rain was also granted. Scarcely had these words dropped from his lips, though we have no other merits, yet remember the sign of the covenant which the Israelites bear upon their bodies when the rain fell to earth. In spite of all these miracles, the people persisted in their idolatrous ways and thoughts. Even the seven thousand who had not bowed down unto Baal were unworthy sons of Israel, for they paid homage to the golden calves of Jeroboam. The misdeeds of the people had swelled to such number that they could no longer reckon upon the merits of the fathers to intercede for them. They had overdrawn their account. When they sank to the point of degradation at which they gave up the sign of the covenant, Elijah could control his wrath no longer, and he accused Israel before God. In the cleft of the rock in which God had once aforetimes appeared to Moses and revealed himself as compassionate and long-suffering, he now met with Elijah, and conveyed to him by various signs that it had been better to defend Israel than accuse him. 
but elijah in his zeal for god was inexorable then god commanded him to appoint elisha as his successor for he said i cannot do as thou wouldst have me furthermore god charged him instead of accusing my children journey to damascus where the gentiles have an idol for each day of the year though israel hath thrown down my altars and slain my prophets what concern is it of thine the four phenomena that god sent before his appearance wind earthquake fire and a still small voice were to instruct elijah about the destiny of man god told elijah that these four represent the worlds through which man must pass the first stands for this world fleeting as the wind the earthquake is the day of death which makes the human body to tremble and quake fire is the tribunal in gehenna and the still small voice is the last judgment when there will be none but god alone about three years later elijah was taken up into heaven but not without first undergoing a struggle with the angel of death he refused to let elijah enter heaven at his translation on the ground that he exercised jurisdiction over all mankind elijah not accepted god maintained that at the creation of heaven and earth he had explicitly ordered the angel of death to grant entrance to the living prophet but the angel of death insisted that by elijah's translation god had given just cause for complaint to all other men who could not escape the doom of death thereupon god elijah is not like other men he is able to banish thee from the world only thou dost not recognize his strength with the consent of god a combat took place between elijah and the angel of death the prophet was victorious and if god had not restrained him he would have annihilated his opponent holding his defeated enemy under his feet elijah ascended heavenward in heaven he goes on living for all time there he sits recording the deeds of men and the chronicles of the world he has another office besides he is the psychopomp whose duty is to stand at the crossways in paradise and guide the pious to their appointed places who brings the souls of sinners up from gehenna at the approach of the sabbath and leads them back again to their merited punishment when the day of rest is about to depart and who conducts these same souls after they have atoned for their sins to the place of everlasting bliss elijah's miraculous deeds will be better understood if we remember that he had been an angel from the very first even before the end of his earthly career when god was about to create man elijah said to him master of the world if it be pleasing in thine eyes i will descend to earth and make myself serviceable to the sons of men then god changed his angel name and later under ahab he permitted him to abide among men on earth that he might convert the world to the belief that the lord is god his mission fulfilled god took him again into heaven and said to him be thou the guardian spirit of my children forever and spread the belief in me abroad in the whole world his angel name is sandalphon one of the greatest and mightiest of the fiery angel host as such it is his duty to wreathe garlands for god out of the prayers sent aloft by israel besides he must offer up sacrifices in the invisible sanctuary for the temple was destroyed only apparently in reality it went on existing hidden from the sight of ordinary mortals after his translation elijah's removal from earth so far from being an interruption to his relations with men rather marks the beginning of his real activity as a helper in time of need as a teacher and as a guide at first his intervention in sublunar affairs was not frequent seven years after his translation he wrote a letter to the wicked king jehoram who reigned over judah the next occasion on which he took part in an earthly occurrence was at the time of ahasuerus when he did the jews a good turn by assuming the guise of the courtier harbona in a favorable moment inciting the king against haman it was reserved for later days however for talmudic times the golden age of the great scholars the tanaim and the amoraim to enjoy elijah's special vigilance as protector of the innocent as a friend in need who hovers over the just and the pious ever present 
to guard them against evil or snatch them out of danger. With four strokes of his wings, Elijah can traverse the world, hence no spot on earth is too far removed for his help. As an angel, he enjoys the power of assuming the most various appearances to accomplish his purposes. Sometimes he looks like an ordinary man, sometimes he takes the appearance of an Arab, sometimes of a horseman. Now he is a Roman court official, now he is a harlot. Once upon a time, it happened that when Nahum, the great and pious teacher, was journeying to Rome on a political mission, he was without knowledge, robbed of the gift he bore to the emperor as an offering from the Jews. When he handed the casket to the ruler, it was found to contain common earth, which the thieves had substituted for the jewels they had abstracted. The emperor thought the Jews were mocking at him, and their representative Nahum was condemned to suffer death. In his piety, the rabbi did not lose confidence in God. He only said, This too is for good. And so it turned out to be. Suddenly, Elijah appeared, and assuming the guise of a court official, he said, Perhaps the earth in this casket is like that used by Abraham for purposes of war. A handful will do the work of swords and bows. At his insistence, the virtues of the earth were tested in the attack upon a city that had long resisted Roman courage and strength. His supposition was verified. The contents of the casket proved more efficacious than all the weapons of the army, and the Romans were victorious. Nahum was dismissed, laden with honors and treasures, and the thieves who had betrayed themselves by claiming the precious earth were executed, for naturally enough Elijah works no wonder for evildoers. Another time, for the purpose of rescuing Rabbi Shelah, Elijah pretended to be a Persian. An informer had announced the rabbi with the Persian government, accusing him of administering the law according to the Jewish code. Elijah appeared as witness for the rabbi and against the informer, and Shelah was honorably dismissed. When the Roman bailiffs were pursuing Rabbi Mir, Elijah joined him in the guise of a harlot. The Roman emissaries desisted from their pursuit, for they could not believe that Rabbi Mir would choose such a companion. A contemporary of Rabbi Mir, Rabbi Simon ben Yohai, who spent thirteen years in a cave to escape the vengeance of the Romans, was informed by Elijah of the death of the Jew-baiting emperor, so that he could leave his hiding place. Equally characteristic is the help Elijah afforded the worthy poor. Frequently he brought them great wealth. Rabbi Kahana was so needy that he had to support himself by peddling with household utensils. Once a lady of high standing endeavored to force him to commit an immoral act, and Kahana, preferring death to iniquity, threw himself from aloft. Though Elijah was at a distance of four hundred parasangs, he hastened to the post in time to catch the rabbi before he touched the ground. Besides, he gave him means enough to enable him to abandon an occupation beset with perils. The rabbi Bar Abahu likewise was a victim of poverty. He admitted to Elijah that on account of his small means he had no time to devote to his studies. Thereupon Elijah led him into paradise bade him remove his mantle and fill it with leaves grown in the regions of the blessed. When the rabbi was about to quit paradise, his garment full of leaves, a voice was heard to say, Who desires to anticipate his share in the world to come during his earthly days, as the rabbi Bar Abahu is doing? The rabbi quickly cast the leaves away. Nevertheless, he received twelve thousand denarii for his upper garment, because it retained the wondrous fragrance of the leaves of paradise." Elijah's help was not confined to poor teachers of the law. All who were in need and were worthy of his assistance had a claim upon him. A poor man, the father of a family in his distress, once prayed to God, O Lord of the world, thou knowest, there is none to whom I can tell my tale of woe, none who will have pity upon me. I have neither brother nor kinsman nor friend, and my starving little ones are crying with hunger. Then do thou have mercy and be compassionate or let death come and put an end to our suffering. His words found a hearing with God, for as he finished, Elijah stood before the poor man and sympathetically inquired why he was weeping. When the prophet had heard the tale of his troubles, he said, Take me and sell me as a slave. The proceeds will suffice for thy needs. At first, the poor man refused to accept the sacrifice, but finally yielded, and Elijah was sold to a prince for eighty denarii. 
this sum formed the nucleus of the fortune which the poor man amassed and enjoyed until the end of his days the prince who had purchased elijah intended to build a palace and he rejoiced to hear that his new slave was an architect he promised elijah liberty if within six months he completed the edifice after nightfall of the same day elijah offered a prayer and instantaneously the palace stood in its place in complete perfection elijah disappeared the next morning the prince was not a little astonished to see the palace finished but when he sought his slave to reward him and sought him in vain he realized that he had had dealings with an angel elijah meantime repaired to the man who had sold him and related his story to him that he might know he had not cheated the purchaser out of his price on the contrary he had enriched him since the palace was worth a hundred times more than the money paid for the pretended slave a similar thing happened to a well-to-do man who lost his fortune and became so poor that he had to do manual labor in the field of another once when he was at work he was accosted by elijah who had assumed the appearance of an arab thou art destined to enjoy seven good years dost thou want them now or at the closing years of thy life the man replied thou art a wizard go in peace i have nothing for thee three times the same question was put three times the same reply was given finally the man said i shall ask the advice of my wife when elijah came again and repeated his question the man following the counsel of his wife said see to it that seven good years come to us at once elijah replied go home before thou crossest thy threshold thy good fortune will have filled thy house and so it was his children had found a treasure in the ground and as he was about to enter his house his wife met him and reported the lucky find his wife was an estimable pious woman and she said to her husband we shall enjoy seven good years let us use this time to practice as much charity as possible perhaps god will lengthen out our period of prosperity after the lapse of seven years during which man and wife used every opportunity of doing good elijah appeared again and announced to the man that the time had come to take away what he had given him the man responded when i accepted thy gift it was after consultation with my wife i should not like to return it without first acquainting her with what is about to happen his wife charged him to say to the old man who had come to resume possession of his property if thou canst find any who will be more conscientious stewards of the pledges entrusted to us than we have been i shall willingly yield them up to thee god recognized that these people had made a proper use of their wealth and he granted it to them as a perpetual possession if elijah was not able to lighten the poverty of the pious he at least sought to inspire them with hope and confidence rabbi akiba the great scholar lived in dire poverty before he became the famous rabbi his rich father-in-law would have nothing to do with him or his wife because the daughter had married akiba against her father's will on a bitter cold winter night akiba could offer his wife who had been accustomed to the luxuries wealth can buy nothing but straw as a bed to sleep upon and he tried to comfort her with assurances of his love for the privations she was suffering at that moment elijah appeared before their hut and cried out in supplicating tones o oh, good people give me i pray you a little bundle of straw my wife has been delivered of a child and i am so poor i haven't even enough straw to make a bed for her now akiba could console his wife with the fact that their own misery was not so great as it might have been and thus elijah had attained his end to sustain the courage of the pious in the form of an arab he once appeared before a very poor man whose piety equaled his poverty he gave him two shekels these two coins brought him such good fortune that he attained great wealth but in his zeal to gather worldly treasures he had no time for deeds of piety and charity elijah again appeared before him and took away the two shekels in a short time the man was as poor as before a third time elijah came to him he was crying bitterly and complaining of his misfortune and the prophet said i shall make thee rich once more if thou wilt promise me under oath thou wilt not let wealth ruin thy character he promised the two shekels were restored to him he regained his wealth and he remained in possession of it for all time because his piety was not curtailed by his riches poverty was not the only form of distress elijah relieved he exercised the functions of a physician upon rabbi shimi bar ashi 
who had swallowed a noxious reptile. Elijah appeared to him as an awe-inspiring horseman, and forced him to apply the preventives against the disease to be expected in these circumstances. He also cured Rabbi Judah Ha Nasi of long continued toothache by laying his hand on the sufferer, and at the same time he brought about the reconciliation of Rabbi Judah with Rabbi Hea, whose form he had assumed. Rabbi Judah paid the highest respect to Rabbi Haya after he found out that Elijah had considered him worthy of taking his appearance. On another occasion, Elijah re-established harmony between a husband and his wife. The woman had come home very late on Friday evening, having allowed herself to be detained by the sermon preached by Rabbi Mir. Her autocratic husband swore she should not enter the house until she had spat in the very face of the highly esteemed rabbi. Meantime, Elijah went to Rabbi Mir and told him a pious woman had fallen into a sore predicament on his account. To help the poor woman, the rabbi resorted to a ruse. He announced that he was looking for one who knew how to cast spells, which was done by spitting into the eye of the afflicted one. When he caught sight of the woman, designated by Elijah, he asked her to try her power upon him. Thus she was able to comply with her husband's requirement without disrespect to the rabbi, and through the instrumentality of Elijah, conjugal happiness was restored to an innocent wife. Elijah's versatility is shown in the following occurrence. A pious man bequeathed a spice garden to his three sons. They took turns in guarding it against thieves. The first night, the oldest son watched the garden. Elijah appeared to him and asked him, My son, what wilt thou have knowledge of the Torah or great wealth or a beautiful wife? He chose wealth, great wealth. Accordingly, Elijah gave him a coin and he became rich. The second son, to whom Elijah appeared the second night, chose knowledge of the Torah. Elijah gave him a book, and he knew the whole Torah. The third son, on the third night, when Elijah put the same choice before him as before his brothers, wished for a beautiful wife. Elijah invited his third brother to go on a journey with him. Their first night was passed at the house of a notorious villain who had a daughter. During the night, Elijah overheard the chickens and the geese say to one another, What a terrible sin that young man must have committed that he should be destined to marry the daughter of so great a villain. The two travelers journeyed on. The second night, the experiences of the first were repeated. The third night, they lodged with a man who had a pretty daughter. During the night, Elijah heard the chickens and the geese say to one another, How great must be the virtues of this young man if he is privileged to marry so beautiful and pious a wife. In the morning, when Elijah arose, he at once became a matchmaker. The young man married the pretty maiden, and husband and wife journeyed homeward in joy. If it became necessary, Elijah was ready to do even the services of a sexton. When Rabbi Akaba died in prison, Elijah betook himself to the dead man's faithful disciple, Rabbi Joshua, and the two together went to the prison. There was none to forbid their entrance. A deep sleep had fallen upon the turnkeys and the prisoners alike. Elijah and Rabbi Joshua took the corpse with them, Elijah bearing it upon his shoulder. Rabbi Joshua, in astonishment, demanded how he, a priest, dared defile himself upon a corpse. The answer was, God forbid, the pious can never cause defilement. All night the two walked on with their burden. At break of day they found themselves near Caesarea. A cave opened before their eyes, and within they saw a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp. They deposited the corpse upon the bed, and left the cave which closed up behind them. Only the light of the lamp, which had lit itself after they left, shone through the chinks. Whereupon Elijah said, Hail, ye just, hail to you who devote yourselves to the study of the law. Hail to you, ye God-fearing men, for your Places are set aside and kept and guarded in paradise for the time to come. Hail to thee, Rabbi Akaba, that thy lifeless body found lodgment for a night in a lovely spot. End of chapter 11, part 1, Elijah. Chapter 7, part 2 of the Legends of the Jews, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, by Lewis Ginsberg. 
Chapter 7, Part 2, Elijah Censor and Avenger Helpfulness and compassion do not paint the whole of the character of Elijah. He remained the stern and inexorable censor whom Ahab feared. The old zeal for the true and the good he never lost, as witness, he once struck a man dead because he failed to perform his devotions with due reverence. There were two brothers, one of them rich and miserly, the other poor and kind-hearted. Elijah, in the garb of an old beggar, approached the rich man and asked him for alms. Repulsed by him, he turned to the poor brother who received him kindly and shared his meager supper with him. On bidding farewell to him and his equally hospitable wife, Elijah said, May God reward you. The first thing you undertake shall be blessed and shall take no end until you yourselves cry out enough. Presently the poor man began to count the few pennies he had to convince himself that they sufficed to purchase bread for his next meal. But the few became many, and he counted and counted, and still their number increased. He counted a whole day and the following night until he was exhausted and had to cry out, Enough! And indeed it was enough, for he had become a very wealthy man. His brother was not a little astonished to see the fortunate change in his kinsman's circumstances, and when he heard how it had come about, he determined, if the opportunity should present itself again, to show his most amiable side to the old beggar with the miraculous power of blessing. He had not long to wait. A few days later he saw the old man pass by. He hastened to accost him, and excusing himself for his unfriendliness at their former meeting, begged him to come into his house. All that the larder afforded was put before Elijah, who pretended to eat of the dainties. At his departure he pronounced a blessing upon his hosts. May the first thing you do have no end until it is enough. The mistress of the house thereupon said to her husband, that we may count gold upon gold undisturbed, let us first attend to our most urgent physical needs. So they did, and they had to continue to do it until life was extinct. The extreme of his rigor Elijah displayed toward teachers of the law. From them he demanded more than obedience to the mere letter of a commandment. For instance, he pronounced severe censure upon Rabbi Ishmael ben Jose, because he was willing to act as bailiff in prosecuting Jewish thieves and criminals. He advised Rabbi Ishmael to follow the example of his father and leave the country. His estrangement from his friend Rabbi Joshua ben Levi is characteristic. One who was sought by the officers of the law took refuge with Rabbi Joshua. His pursuers were informed of his place of concealment, threatening to put all the inhabitants of the city to the sword if he was not delivered up, they demanded his surrender. The rabbi urged the fugitive from justice to resign himself to his fate. Better for one individual to die, he said, than for a whole community to be exposed to peril. The fugitive yielded to the rabbi's argument and gave himself up to the bailiffs, Thereafter, Elijah, who had been in the habit of visiting Rabbi Joshua frequently, stayed away from his house, and he was induced to come back only by the rabbi's long fasts and earnest prayers. In reply to the rabbi's question why he had shunned him, he said, Dost thou suppose I care to have intercourse with informers? The rabbi quoted a passage from the Mishnah, to justify his conduct, but Elijah remained unconvinced. Dost thou consider this a law for a pious man? He said, Other people might have been right in doing as thou didst. Thou shouldst have done otherwise. A number of instances are known which show how exalted a standard Elijah set up for those who would be considered worthy of intercourse with him. Of two pious brothers, one provided for his servants as for his own table, while the other permitted his servants to eat abundantly only of the first course. Of the other courses, they could have nothing but the remnants. 
Accordingly, with the second brother, Elijah would have nothing to do, while he often honored the former with his visits. A similar attitude Elijah maintained toward another pair of pious brothers. One of them was in the habit of providing for his servants after his own needs were satisfied, while the other of them attended to the needs of his servants first. To the latter it was that Elijah gave the preference. He dissolved an intimacy of many years standing because his friend built a vestibule which was so constructed that the supplications of the poor could be heard but faintly by those within the house. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi incurred the displeasure of Elijah a second time because a man was torn in pieces by a lion in the vicinity of his house. In a measure, Elijah held Rabbi responsible because he did not pray for the prevention of such misfortunes. The story told of Elijah and Rabbi Anan forms the most striking illustration of the severity of the prophet. Someone brought Rabbi Anan a mess of little fish as a present, and at the same time asked the rabbi to act as judge in a lawsuit he was interested in. Anan refused in these circumstances to accept a gift from the litigant. To demonstrate his single-mindedness, the applicant urged the rabbi to take the fish and assign the case to another judge. Anan acquiesced, and he requested one of his colleagues to act for him, because he was incapacitated from serving as a judge. His legal friend drew the inference that the litigant introduced to him was a kinsman of Rabbi Anan's, and accordingly he showed himself particularly complacent toward him. As a result, the other party to the suit was intimidated. He failed to present his side as convincingly as he might otherwise have done, and so lost the case. Elijah, who had been the friend of Anan and his teacher as well, thenceforth shunned his presence because he considered that the injury done the second party to the suit was due to Anan's carelessness. Anan, in his distress, kept many fasts and offered up many prayers before Elijah would return to him. Even then the rabbi could not endure the sight of him. He had to content himself with listening to Elijah's words without looking upon his face. Sometimes Elijah considered it his duty to force people into abandoning a bad habit. A rich man was once going to a cattle sale, and he carried a snug sum of money to buy oxen. He was accosted by a stranger, none other than Elijah, who inquired the purpose of his journey. I go to buy cattle, replied the would-be purchaser. Say, if it please God, urged Elijah, fiddlesticks, I shall buy cattle whether it please God or not. I carry the money with me, and the business will be dispatched. But not with good fortune, said the stranger, and went off. Arrived at the market, the cattle buyer discovered the loss of his purse, and he had to return home to provide himself with other money. He again set forth on his journey, but this time he took another road to avoid the stranger of ill omen. To his amazement, he met an old man with whom he had precisely the same adventure as with the first stranger. Again he had to return home to fetch money. By this time, he had learned his lesson. When a third stranger questioned him about the object of his journey, he answered, If it please God, I intend to buy oxen. The stranger wished him success, and the wish was fulfilled. To the merchant's surprise, when a pair of fine cattle were offered him, and their price exceeded the sum of money he had about his person, he found the two purses he had lost on his first and second trips. Later, he sold the same pair of oxen to the king for a considerable price, and he became very wealthy. As Elijah coerced this merchant into humility toward God, so he carried home a lesson to the great Tana Eliezer, the son of Rabbi Simon ben Yohai. This rabbi stood in need of correction on account of his overweening conceit. Once, on returning from the academy, he took a walk on the sea beach, his bosom swelling with pride at the thought of his attainments in the Torah. He met a hideously ugly man, who greeted him with the words, Peace be with thee, Rabbi. Eliezer, instead of courteously acknowledging the greeting, said, 
O oh, thou white, how ugly thou art! Is it possible that all the residents of thy town are as ugly as thou? I know not, was the reply, but it is the master artificer who created me that thou shouldst have said, How ugly is this vessel which thou hast fashioned? The rabbi realized the wrong he had committed and humbly begged pardon of the ugly man, another of the protean forms adopted by Elijah. The latter continued to refer him to the master artificer of the ugly vessel, the inhabitants of the city, who had hastened to do honor to the great rabbi, earnestly urged the offended man to grant pardon, and finally he declared himself appeased, provided the rabbi promised never again to commit the same wrong. The rigor practiced by Elijah toward his friends caused one of them, the Tanner Rabbi Jose, to accuse him of being passionate and irascible. As a consequence, Elijah would have nothing to do with him for a long time. When he reappeared and confessed the cause of his withdrawal, Rabbi Jose said he felt justified, for his charge could not have received a more striking verification. Intercourse with the Sages Elijah's purely human relations to the world reveal themselves in their fullness, neither in his deeds of charity nor in his censorious rigor, but rather in his gentle and scholarly intercourse with the great in Israel, especially the learned rabbis of the Talmudic time. He is at once their disciple and their teacher. To one he resorts for instruction on difficult points. To another he himself dispenses instruction. As a matter of course, his intimate knowledge of the supernatural world makes him appear more frequently in the role of giver than receiver. Many a bit of secret lore the Jewish teachers learnt from Elijah, and he it was who, with the swiftness of lightning, carried the teachings of one rabbi to another, sojourning hundreds of miles away. Thus it was Elijah who taught Rabbi Jose the deep meaning hidden in the scriptural passage in which woman is designated as the helpmeet of man. By means of examples, he demonstrated to the rabbi how indispensable woman is to man. Rabbi Nehorai profited by his exposition of why God created useless, even noxious insects. The reason for their existence is that the sight of superfluous and harmful creatures prevents God from destroying his world at times when, on account of the wickedness and iniquity prevailing in it, it repents him of having created it. If he preserves creatures that at their best are useless and at their worst injurious, how much more should he preserve human beings with all their potentialities for good? The same Rabbi Nehorai was told by Elijah that God sends earthquakes and other destructive phenomena when he sees places of amusement prosperous and flourishing, while the temple lies a heap of dust and ashes. To Rabbi Judah he communicated the following three maxims, Let not anger master thee, and thou wilt not fall into sin. Let not drink master thee, and thou wilt be spared pain. Before thou settest out on a journey, take counsel with thy Creator. In case of a difference of opinion among scholars, Elijah was usually questioned as to how the moot point was interpreted in the heavenly academy. Once, when the scholars were not unanimous in their views as to Esther's intentions when she invited Haman to her banquets with the king, Elijah asked by Rabbi Bar Abahu to tell him her real purpose said that each and every one of the motives attributed to her by various scholars were true, for her invitations to Haman had many a purpose. A similar answer he gave the Amora Abiathar, who disputed with his colleagues as to why the Ephraimite, who caused the war against the tribe of Benjamin, first cast off his concubine and then became reconciled to her. 
Elijah informed Rabbi Abiathar that in heaven the cruel conduct of the Ephraimite was explained in two ways, according to Abiathar's conception and according to his opponent Jonathan's as well. Regarding the great contest between Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus and the whole body of scholars in which the majority maintained the validity of its opinion, though a heavenly voice pronounced Rabbi Eliezer's correct, Elijah told Rabbi Nathan that God in his heaven had cried out, My children have prevailed over me. On one occasion, Elijah fared badly for having betrayed celestial events to his scholars. He was a daily attendant at the academy of Rabbi Judah Ha Nasi. One day, it was the new moon day, he was late. The reason for his tardiness, he said, was that it was his daily duty to awaken the three patriarchs, wash their hands for them, so that they might offer up their prayers, and after their devotions, lead them back to their resting places. On this day, their prayers took very long, because they were increased by the Musaf service on account of the new moon celebration, and hence he did not make his appearance at the academy in good time. Elijah did not end his narrative at this point, but went on to tell the rabbi that this occupation of his was rather tedious, for the three patriarchs were not permitted to offer up their prayers at the same time. Abraham prayed first, then came Isaac, and finally Jacob. If they all were to pray together, the united petitions of three such paragons of piety would be so efficacious as to force God to fulfill them and he would be induced to bring the Messiah before his time. Then Rabbi Judah wanted to know whether there were any among the pious on earth whose prayer possessed equal efficacy. Elijah admitted that the same power resided in the prayers of Rabbi Hayah and his two sons. Rabbi Judah lost no time in proclaiming a day of prayer and fasting and summoning Rabbi Hayah and his sons to officiate as the leaders in prayer. They began to chant the eighteen benedictions, then they uttered the word for wind. A storm arose. When they continued and made petition for rain, the rain descended at once. But as the readers approached the passage relating to the revival of the dead, great excitement arose in heaven, and when it became known that Elijah had revealed the secret of the marvelous power attaching to the prayers of the three men, he was punished with fiery blows. To thwart Rabbi Judah's purpose, Elijah assumed the form of a bear and put the praying congregation to flight. Contrariwise, Elijah was also in the habit of reporting earthly events in the celestial regions. He told Rabbi Bar Shila that the reason Rabbi Mir was never quoted in the academy on high was because he had had so wicked a teacher as Elisha ben Abuya. Rabbi explained Rabbi Mir's conduct by an apologue. Rabbi Mir, he said, found a pomegranate. He enjoyed the heart of the fruit and cast the skin aside. Elijah was persuaded of the justness of this defense, and so were all the celestial powers. Thereupon, one of Rabbi Mir's interpretations was quoted in the heavenly academy. Elijah was no less interested in the persons of the learned than in their teachings, especially when scholars were to be provided with the means of devoting themselves to their studies. It was he who, when Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, later a great celebrity, resolved to devote himself to the law, advised him to repair to Jerusalem and sit at the feet of Rabbi Johanan ben Zakkai. He once met a man who mocked at his exhortations to study, and he said that on the great day of reckoning he would excuse himself for his neglect of intellectual pursuits by the fact that he had been granted neither intelligence nor wisdom. Elijah asked him what his calling was. I am a fisherman, was the reply. Well, my son, questioned Elijah, who taught thee to take flax and make nets and throw them into the sea to catch fish? He replied, For this heaven gave me intelligence and insight. Hereupon, Elijah, if thou possessest intelligence and insight to cast nets and catch fish, why should these qualities desert thee when thou dealest with the Torah, which thou knowest is very nigh unto man that he may do it? 
The fisherman was touched, and he began to weep. Elijah pacified him by telling him that what he had said applied to many another beside him. In another way, Elijah conveyed the lesson of the great value residing in devotion to the study of the Torah. Disguised as a rabbi, he was approached by a man who promised to relieve him of all material cares if he would but abide with him. Refusing to leave Jabna, the center of Jewish scholarship, he said to the tempter, Wert thou to offer me a thousand million gold denarii, I would not quit the abode of the law and dwell in a place in which there is no Torah. By Torah, of course, is meant the law as conceived and interpreted by the sages and the scholars, for Elijah was particularly solicitous to establish the authority of the oral law, as he was solicitous to demonstrate the truth of scriptural promises that appeared incredible at first sight. For instance, he once fulfilled Rabbi Joshua ben Levi's wish to see the precious stones which would take the place of the sun in illuminating Jerusalem in the Messianic time. A vessel in mid-ocean was nigh unto shipwreck. Among a large number of heathen passengers, there was a single Jewish youth. To him Elijah appeared and said he would rescue the vessel, provided the boy went to Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, and took him to a certain place far removed from the town and from human habitation, and showed him the gems. The boy doubted that so great a man would consent to follow a mere slip of a youth to a remote spot, but reassured by Elijah, who told him of Rabbi Joshua's extraordinary modesty, he undertook the commission, and the vessel with its human freight was saved. The boy came to the rabbi, besought him to go whither he would lead, and Joshua, who was really possessed of great modesty, followed the boy three miles without even inquiring the purpose of the expedition. When they finally reached the cave, the boy said, See, here are the precious stones. The rabbi grasped them, and a flood of light spread as far as Lydda, the residence of Rabbi Joshua. Startled, he cast the precious stones away from him, and they disappeared. This rabbi was a particular favorite of Elijah, who even secured him an interview with the Messiah. The rabbi found the Messiah among the crowd of afflicted poor gathered near the city gates of Rome, and he greeted him with the words, Peace be with thee, my teacher and guide. Whereunto the Messiah replied, Peace be with thee, thou son of Levi. The rabbi then asked him when he would appear, and the Messiah said, Today. Elijah explained to the rabbi later that what the Messiah meant by today was that he for his part was ready to bring Israel redemption at any time. If Israel but showed himself worthy, he would instantly fulfill his mission. Elijah wanted to put Rabbi Joshua into communication with the departed Rabbi Simon ben Yohai also, but the latter did not consider him of sufficient importance to honor him with his conversation. Rabbi Simon had addressed a question to him, and Rabbi Joshua in his modesty had made a reply not calculated to give one a high opinion of him. In reality, Rabbi Joshua was the possessor of such sterling qualities that when he entered paradise, Elijah walked before him calling out, Make room for the son of Levi. End of chapter 7, part 2 Elijah Chapter 7, Part 3 of The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4 by Lewis Ginsburg. Chapter 7, Part 3, Elijah. God's Justice Vindicated 
Among the many and various teachings dispensed by Elijah to his friends, there are none so important as his theodicy, the teachings vindicating God's justice in the administration of earthly affairs. He used many an opportunity to demonstrate it by precept and example. Once he granted his friend Rabbi Joshua ben Levi the fulfillment of any wish he might express, and all the rabbi asked for was that he might be permitted to accompany Elijah on his wanderings through the world. Elijah was prepared to gratify this wish. He only imposed the condition that, however odd the rabbi might think Elijah's actions, he was not to ask any explanation of them. If ever he demanded why, they would have to part company. So Elijah and the rabbi fared forth together, and they journeyed on until they reached the house of a poor man whose only earthly possession was a cow. The man and his wife were thoroughly good-hearted people, and they received the two wanderers with a cordial welcome. They invited the strangers into their house, set before them food and drink of the best they had, and made up a comfortable couch for them for the night. When Elijah and the rabbi were ready to continue their journey on the following day, Elijah prayed that the cow belonging to his host might die. Before they left the house, the animal had expired. Rabbi Joshua was so shocked by the misfortune that had befallen the good people, he almost lost consciousness. He thought, is that to be the poor man's reward for all his kind services to us? And he could not refrain from putting the question to Elijah. But Elijah reminded him of the condition imposed and accepted at the beginning of their journey, and they traveled on, the rabbi's curiosity unappeased. That night they reached the house of a wealthy man who did not pay his guests the courtesy of looking them in the face. Though they passed the night under his roof, he did not offer them food or drink. This rich man was desirous of having a wall repaired that had tumbled down. There was no need for him to take any steps to have it rebuilt, for when Elijah left the house, he prayed that the wall might erect itself, and lo, it stood upright. Rabbi Joshua was greatly amazed, but true to his promise, he suppressed the question that rose to his lips. So the two traveled on again until they reached an ornate synagogue, the seats in which were made of silver and gold. But the worshippers did not correspond in character to the magnificence of the building, for when it came to the point of satisfying the needs of the wayworn pilgrims, one of those present said, There is not dearth of water and bread, and the strange travelers can stay in the synagogue whither these refreshments can be brought to them. Early the next morning, when they were departing, Elijah wished those present in the synagogue in which they had lodged that God might raise them all to be heads. Rabbi Joshua again had to exercise great self-restraint and not put into words the question that troubled him profoundly. In the next town they were received with great affability and served abundantly with all their tired bodies craved. On these kind hosts, Elijah, on leaving, bestowed the wish that God might give them but a single head. Now the rabbi could not hold himself in check any longer, and he demanded an explanation of Elijah's freakish actions. Elijah consented to clear up his conduct for Joshua before they separated from each other. He spoke as follows. The poor man's cow was killed because I knew that on the same day the death of his wife had been ordained in heaven, and I prayed to God to accept the loss of the poor man's property as a substitute for the poor man's wife. As for the rich man, there was a treasure hidden under the dilapidated wall, and if he had rebuilt it, he would have found the gold. Hence I set up the wall miraculously in order to deprive the curmudgeon of the valuable find. I wished that the inhospitable people assembled in the synagogue might have many heads, for a place of numerous leaders is bound to be ruined by reason of multiplicity of counsels and disputes. 
To the inhabitants of our last sojourning place, on the other hand, I wished a single head for the one to guide a town, successful attend all its undertakings. Know then that if thou seest an evil doer prosper, it is not always unto his advantage, and if a righteous man suffers need and distress, think not God is unjust. After these words, Elijah and Rabbi Joshua separated from each other, and each went his own way. How difficult it is to form a true judgment with nothing but external appearances as a guide, Elijah proved to Rabbi Baroka. They were once wailing in a crowded street, and the rabbi requested Elijah to point out any in the throng destined to occupy places in paradise. Elijah answered that there was none, only to contradict himself and point to a passer-by the very next minute. His appearance was such that in him, least of all, the rabbi would have suspected a pious man. His garb did not even indicate that he was a Jew. Later, Rabbi Baroka discovered by questioning him that he was a prison guard. In the fulfillment of his duties as such, he was particularly careful that the virtue of chastity should not be violated in the prison, in which both men and women were kept in detention. Also, his position often brought him into relations with the heathen authorities, and so he was enabled to keep the Jews informed of the disposition entertained toward them by the powers that be. The rabbi was thus taught that no station in life precluded its occupant from doing good and acting nobly. Another time Elijah designated two men to whom a great future was assigned in paradise, yet these men were nothing more than clowns. They made it their purpose in life to dispel discontent and sorrow by their jokes and their cheery humor, and they used the opportunities granted by their profession to adjust the difficulties and quarrels that disturb the harmony of people living in close contact with each other. Elijah and the Angel of Death Among the many benevolent deeds of Elijah, special mention ought to be made of his rescue of those doomed by a heavenly decree to fall into the clutches of the Angel of Death. He brought these rescues about by warning the designated victims of their impending fate and urging them to do good deeds which would prove protection against death. There was once a pious and rich man with a beautiful and saintly daughter. She had had the misfortune of losing three husbands in succession, each on the day after the wedding. These sorrows determined her never again to enter into the marriage state. A cousin of hers, the nephew of her father, induced by the poverty of his parents, journeyed from his distant home to apply for help to his rich uncle. Scarcely had he laid eyes upon his lovely cousin when he fell victim to her charms. In vain her father sought to dissuade his nephew from marrying his daughter, but the fate of his predecessors did not affright him, and the wedding took place. While he was standing under the wedding canopy, Elijah came to him in the guise of an old man and said, "'My son, I want to give thee a piece of advice.' While thou art seated at the wedding dinner, thou wilt be approached by a ragged, dirty beggar with hair like nails. As soon as thou catchest sight of him, hasten to seat him beside thee, set food and drink before him, and be ready to grant whatever he may ask of thee. Do as I say, and thou wilt be protected against harm. Now I shall leave thee and go my way." At the wedding feast, a stranger, as described by Elijah, appeared, and the bridegroom did, according to Elijah's counsel. After the wedding, the stranger revealed his identity, introducing himself as the messenger of the Lord sent to take the young husband's life. The supplications of the bridegroom failed to move him. He refused to grant a single day's respite. All he yielded was permission to the young husband to bid farewell to his newly wed wife. When the bride saw that what she had feared was coming to pass, she repaired to the angel of death and argued with him. 
The Torah distinctly exempts the newly wed from all duties for a whole year. If thou deprivest my husband of life, thou wilt give the lie to the Torah. Thereupon God commanded the angel of death to desist, and when the relatives of the bride came to prepare the grave of the groom, they found him well and unharmed. A similar thing befell the son of the great and extremely pious scholar, Rabbi Reuben. To him came the angel of death and announced that his only son would have to die. The pious man was resigned. We mortals can do nothing to oppose a divine decree, he said. I pray thee, give him thirty days' respite that I may see him married. The angel of death acquiesced. The rabbi, told no one of this encounter, waited until the appointed time was drawing to a close, and on the very last day, the thirtieth, he arranged his son's wedding feast. On that day, the bridegroom-to-be met Elijah, who told him of his approaching death. A worthy son of his father, he said, who may oppose God, and am I better than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They, too, had to die. Elijah told him furthermore that the angel of death would appear to him in the guise of a ragged, dirty beggar, and he advised him to receive him in the kindliest possible manner, and in particular he was to insist upon his taking food and drink from him. All happened as Elijah had predicted, and his advice too proved efficacious, for the heart of the angel of death, who finally revealed his identity with the beggar, was softened by the entreaties of the father, combined with the tears of the young wife, who resorted to the argument cited above of the year of exemption from duty granted to the newly married. The angel of death, disarmed by the amiable treatment accorded to him, himself went before the throne of God and presented the young wife's petition. The end was God added seventy years to the life of Rabbi Reuben's son. Teacher of the Kabbalah The frequent meetings between Elijah and the teachers of the law of the Talmudic time were invested with personal interest only. Upon the development of the Torah, they had no influence whatsoever. His relation to the mystic science was of quite other character. It is safe to say that what Moses was to the Torah, Elijah was to the Kabbalah. His earliest relation to it was established through Rabbi Simon ben Yohai and his son Rabbi Eliezer. For thirteen years he visited them twice daily in their subterranean hiding place and imparted the secrets of the Torah to them. A thousand years later, Elijah again gave the impetus to the development of the Kabbalah, for it was he that revealed mysteries, first to the Nazarite Rabbi Jacob, then to his disciple of the latter, Abraham ben David. The mysteries in the books Pelai and Cana, the author Elkanah, owed wholly to Elijah. He had appeared to him in the form of a venerable old man, and had imparted to him the secret lore taught in the heavenly academy. Besides, he led him to a fiery rock whereon mysterious characters were engraved, which were deciphered by Elkanah. After his disciple had thus become thoroughly impregnated with mystical teachings, Elijah took him to the tomb of the patriarchs and thence to the heavenly academy. But the angels, little pleased by the intrusion of one born of woman, inspired him with such terror that he besought Elijah to carry him back to earth. His mentor allayed his fears and long continued to instruct him in the mystical science according to the system his disciple has recorded in his two works. The Kabbalists in general were possessed of the power to cite Elijah to conjure him up by means of certain formulas. One of them, Rabbi Joseph de la Reina, once called upon Elijah in this way, but it proved his own undoing. He was a saintly scholar, and he had conceived no less a purpose than to bring about the redemption of man by the conquest of the angel Samael, the prince of evil. After many prayers and vigils, and long indulgence in fasting and other ascetic practices, Rabbi Joseph united himself with his five disciples for the purpose of conjuring up Elijah. When the prophet, obeying the summons, suddenly stood before him, Rabbi Joseph spoke as follows. 
Peace be with thee, our master, true prophet, bearer of salvation. Be not displeased with me that I have troubled thee to come hither. God knows I have not done it for myself and not for mine own honor. I am zealous for the name and the honor of God, and I know thy desire is the same as mine, for it is thy vocation to make the glory of God to prevail on earth. I pray thee, therefore, to grant my petition. Tell me with what means I can conquer Satan. Elijah at first endeavored to dissuade the rabbi from his enterprise. He described the great power of Satan, ever growing as it feeds upon the sins of mankind. But Rabbi Joseph could not be made to desist. Elijah then enumerated what measures and tactics he would have to observe in his combat with the fallen angel. He enumerated the pious saintly deeds that would win the interest of the archangel Sandolphin in his undertaking, and from this angel he would learn the method of warfare to be pursued. The rabbi followed out Elijah's directions carefully and succeeded in summoning Sandolphin to his assistance. If he had continued to obey instructions implicitly and had carried out all Sandalphon advised, the rabbi would have triumphed over Satan and hastened the redemption of the world. Unfortunately, at one point the rabbi committed an indiscretion, and he lost the great advantages he had gained over Satan, who used his restored power to bring ruin upon him and his disciples. The radical transformation in the character of Kabbalistic teaching, which is connected with the name of Rabbi Isaac Loria, likewise is an evidence of Elijah's activity. Elijah sought out this father of the Kabbalistic Renaissance and revealed the mysteries of the universe to him. Indeed, he had shown his interest in him long before anyone suspected the future greatness of Rabbi Isaac. Immediately after his birth, Elijah appeared to the father of the babe and enjoined him not to have the rite of circumcision performed until he should be told by Elijah to proceed. The eighth day of the child's life arrived. The whole congregation was assembled at the synagogue to witness the solemn ceremonial, but to the great astonishment of his fellow townsmen, the father delayed it. The people naturally did not know he was waiting for Elijah to appear, and he was called upon once and again to have the ceremony take place, but he did not permit the impatience of the company to turn him from his purpose. Suddenly Elijah, unseen of course by the others, appeared to him and bade him have the ceremony performed. Those present were under the impression that the father was holding the child on his knees during the circumcision. In reality, however, it was Elijah. After the rite was completed, Elijah handed the infant back to the father with the words, Here is thy child. Take good care of it, for it will spread a brilliant light over the world. It was also Elijah who, in a similar way, informed Rabbi Eliezer, the father of Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tob, the father of him whose name is unrivaled in the annals of the Hasidic Kabbalah, that a son would be born to him who should enlighten the eyes of Israel. This Rabbi Eliezer was justly reputed to be very hospitable. He was in the habit of stationing guards at the entrances to the village in which he lived, and they were charged to bring all strangers to his house. In heaven it was ordained that Rabbi Eliezer's hospitable instincts should be put to a test. Elijah was chosen for the experiment. On a Sabbath afternoon, arrayed in the garb of a beggar, he entered the village with knapsack and staff. Rabbi Eliezer, taking no notice of the fact that the beggar was desecrating the Sabbath, received him kindly, attended to his bodily wants, and the next morning, on parting with him, gave him some money besides. Touched by his kind-heartedness, Elijah revealed his identity and the purpose of his disguise, and told him that, as he had borne the trial so well, he would be rewarded by the birth of a son who should enlighten the eyes of Israel." Forerunner of the Messiah. Many sided though Elijah's participation in the course of historical events is, it cannot be compared with what he is expected to do in the days of the Messiah. He is charged with the mission of ordering the coming time aright and restoring the tribes of Jacob. 
His messianic activity thus is to be twofold. He is to be the forerunner of the Messiah, yet in part he will himself realize the promised scheme of salvation. His first task will be to induce Israel to repent when the Messiah is about to come and to establish peace and harmony in the world. Hence he will have to settle all legal difficulties and solve all legal problems that have accumulated since days immemorial and decide vexed questions of ritual concerning which authors entertain contradictory views. In short, all difference of opinion must be removed from the path of the Messiah. This office of expounder of the law, Elijah, will continue to occupy even after the reign of peace has been established on earth, and his relation to Moses will be the same as Aaron once held. Elijah's preparatory work will be begun three days before the advent of the Messiah. Then he will appear in Palestine and will utter a lament over the devastation of the Holy Land, and his wail will be heard throughout the world. The last words of his elegy will be, Now peace will come upon earth. When the evildoers hear this message, they will rejoice. On the second day he will appear again and proclaim, Good will come upon earth and on the third his promise will be heard salvation will come upon earth. Then Michael will blow the trumpet, and once more Elijah will make his appearance, this time to introduce the Messiah. To make sure of the identity of the Messiah, the Jews will demand that he perform the miracle of resurrection before their eyes, reviving such of the dead as they had known personally. But the Messiah will do the following seven wonders. He will bring Moses and the generation of the desert to life. Korah and his band he will raise from out of the earth. He will revive the Ephraimitic Messiah who was slain. He will show the three holy vessels of the temple, the ark, the flask of manna, and the cruise of sacred oil, all three of which disappeared mysteriously. He will wave the scepter given him by God. He will grind the mountains of the holy land into powder like straw, and he will reveal the secret of redemption. Then the Jews will believe that Elijah is the Elijah promised to them, and the Messiah introduced by him is the true Messiah. The Messiah will have Elijah blow the trumpet, and at the first sound the primal light which shone before the week of creation will reappear. At the second sound the dead will arise, and with the swiftness of wind assemble around the Messiah from all corners of the earth. At the third sound the Shekinah will become visible to all the mountains will be raised at the fourth sound, and the temple will stand in complete perfection as Ezekiel described it. During the reign of peace, Elijah will be one of the eight princes forming the cabinet of the Messiah. Even the coming of the great judgment day will not end his activity. On that day, the children of the wicked who had to die in infancy on account of the sins of their fathers will be found among the just, while their fathers will be ranged on the other side. The babes will implore their fathers to come to them, but God will not permit it. Then Elijah will go to the little ones and teach them how to plead in behalf of their fathers. They will stand before God and say, Is not the measure of good the mercy of God larger than the measure of chastisements? If then we died for the sins of our fathers, should they not now for our sakes be granted the good and be permitted to join us in paradise? God will give assent to their pleadings, and Elijah will have fulfilled the word of the prophet Malachi. He will have brought back the fathers to the children. The last act of Elijah's brilliant career will be the execution of God's command to slay Samael and so banish evil forever. End of chapter 7, part 3, Elijah.